Are you feeling relaxed? I must say, this is the most relaxed time I'm standing on stage and giving um, a presentation. So thank you, Karen, for having this little yoga session. So I'm going to talk about digital enablement of uh, patients. So, but before I do that, um, I have one page to share with you. So that is, um, I was asked to um, present this conflict of interest page. I'm working for a large American corporate. This is a page you, that you get back if you ask legal. Um, so we have nothing to declare. So why am I going to talk about digital enablement of, um, of patients? You could say, digitization, is there anything new? Aren't we having computers since 50, 60 years? So I think there is one thing new, there's one thing different, and what is different is that digitization now enters or has entered the third phase. The first phase, that was 60 years ago, when information was made readable by the first computers that you found in large companies or at, at universities. 30 years ago, that, or 20 years ago, that information was made reachable through the internet. You could access information much, much easier. You didn't have to go to the library anymore. And 10 years ago, something happened, and that is the third phase, and that is this information became searchable by search engines, and this information became accessible almost any time, any place with your mobile devices. I say almost any time and any place because um, the Hilton, La Défense in Paris, yesterday evening, it did not work. <laughs> so, and this digitization, this third phase of digitization has actually quite some impact, and it had impact already on a couple of industries. Just think about the banking industry. 10 years ago, 80%, uh, 20% of all 20% uh, of all banking and, and money transfers were done online. Today, only 20% of all banking customers actually visit a branch anymore. 20% of all book sales in Germany are now done online, and it's assumed that this will double in the next couple of years. 90% of all airline tickets are purchased online after very often after having done a very comprehensive and detailed price comparison uh, in the internet. So it happens, it transforms industries and consumers like it. They get better prices, it's more convenient, so this really drives adoption. Now let's have a look at, at healthcare. So how is, where does healthcare stand in terms of, um, of digitization? So there is for sure an enormous amount of data available. Just think about all these digital images that are taken every day by um, radiologists. So there's an enormous amount of data. So there's a common sense that all this data must have some value. And there's common sense as well that this data, or the insight and the value from this data is not fully captured. And the reasons are relatively clear. The reasons are the data resides in silos. Uh, the data is not linked, the data is not integrated. So let's understand um, why this is indeed an untapped potential. And the first example that I would like to share with you is um, on medication errors. So I think it's well known that adverse drug events are something which are a serious safety issue, and it's estimated that roughly 3% of all hospital stays uh, are caused by adverse drug events. So we worked for a public payer in Germany, and we looked into his claims data of um, two million lives, and uh, we asked ourselves, how often are these adverse drug events actually happening? And what we found was quite interesting. So you have here all the uh, drug, uh, drug combinations which are not harmful. These this drug, drug interaction rules are taken from one of the leading um, pharmaceutical databases in, um, in Germany. So, and there are two classes, um, three classes. So the ones where drug-drug inter uh, interaction doesn't make anything, doesn't, doesn't, um, uh, is not harmful. Then you have the yellow ones where drug-drug interaction is potentially harmful, but you can do it if you monitor the patient properly. And then you have the ones here on top where it's, it's, really, it's really harmful. Yeah? So 220 of these combinations are documented in, in this database. And what we found interesting is this happens relatively rarely. 
there are very few prescriptions of drugs that should not prescribe because they are really, really harmful, yeah, like lopidogrel and, and PPIs. So then we looked into the next group, and this was quite interesting because almost 40% of all patients who are getting more than, than one drug, they have a, combinations of, a combination of drug that should not be prescribed, or if it's prescribed, should be closely monitored. And uh, what we then found is that while hospital stays caused by these really harmful drugs are very rarely, they happen quite often. They happen quite often in this middle box yeah, where you can prescribe it, but you need to monitor it. So I don't know why. Maybe the doctor wasn't aware. Maybe two different doctors have been prescribing these drugs. Maybe the doctor was aware and even told his patient to come to his practice every four weeks to be closely monitored, but the patient didn't care. So there are many, many different reasons um, why uh, this is happening, but we just see no causality, just correlation. It, it happens. Another example is about um, the treatment of patients with chronic conditions. Yeah? So again, for um, a payer with more than four million uh, beneficiaries, if you look at congestive heart failure, there are guidelines. It's relatively clear how this should be treated according to the severity of, of the disease. But if you look at patients and how many of them get actually a medication according to guidelines, you learn something which is surprising. Roughly 50%, yeah, only half of the patients with NUHA2 and, and higher actually get the medication according to guidelines. And the other patients don't. Yeah, they got only partial uh, partial medication, or they'd even get no medication at all. And what is even worse, if you look at the number of subsequent hospital stays, if you look at the mortality, then patients who are getting the medication according to guideline are better off. They are less in the hospital, and they, are, they um, have a higher, a higher survival rate. So what I want to say on my hypothesis is, can digital enablement of patients, can it do something? I believe it can. Indeed, it can, and um, here are the reasons why. The first reason is the digital matur maturity of patients is increasing. They want to use these digital channels. Second, they are using it already. They're using it in different spaces, and you can see um, they, they actually want to um, leverage and, and use these digital services. And then last but not least, there are three trends who are accelerating this. Um, and I'm happy to share some of the latest trends, some of them just coming from the Silicon Valley. So we did a representative survey in the UK, in Germany, as well as in Singapore. So these are the results from the UK, where we asked patients, how would you like to interact with your payer? Not with your physician, but with your payer. Because we wanted to understand how are digital channels used today. So you see digital channels, email, websites, smartphone apps and, and social media. What you can see, they use it, but not at such a, at such a high degree. Yeah? Social media is even rarely used. Then we ask the question, how are you planning to use it going forward? And what you can see, they want to use it more. They want to use it massively more. For email and websites and, and online portals, this is 42 to 47 percentage points more. For smartphone, mobile devices, this is 33% uh, more. For social media, is, it is definitely smaller. So there is the will and the interest of patients. And what do patients want? So we ask them in free text, what are you interested in? And what they want is something relatively simple. They want online bookings. They want online appointments. They want prescription, automated refill. They want to view their lab results. They want to... Um, get advice and, and guidance from, from their doctors, all via, via online services. And this is already available today. And um, so patients use it to inform themselves. NHS Choices has 20 million visitors per month. WebMD is another large site. And in literally any country of the world, you find these, uh, you find these websites where patients find information about healthcare. Um, patients use it as well for interaction, you know, for administrative interaction. One startup from the US that probably many of, new, of you know is ZocDoc. They do something amazing. They offer online appointment making for free. So you can go to their website if you are in, let's say, New York. 
You type in, I want to see a dermatologist. The dermatologist should speak German, and I want to see him um, um, on, on, on Tuesday or on, on, on Wednesday next week. And what you then find is it gives you a list of doctors, including a rating. You can click on one of them. You see when he has slots free, and then you book an appointment. So this is a service which is highly um, liked by, uh, by patients, and doctors like it as well. Kaiser Permanente offers administrative interaction as well. For example, you can view your lab tests um, online. You use it, patients use it for clinical interaction as well. Dr. Tom is an online physician consulting site in the, um, in the UK, what they do. You can call them, you can have an online, an online video chat, um, and they have 5,000 consultations every week. So it's something what patients use. Patients like me is a, is a community of people suffering from rare diseases and chronic conditions where they form communities and exchange opinions and exchange experience about treatment protocols. And last but not least, um, who has one of these new wearables? Any, any of you wearing them? So very few. So I, have t I had two. They both are broke. So uh, they promised to change people's life, so maybe I didn't wear them long enough, so they didn't change mine. So the Fitbits and the Jawbones, these are these little uh, thingies that you, that you wear on your wrist, and they track your activity, they track how you sleep, and um, increasingly people use it, and they learn something about it, and I'll tell you in a minute why I think this is an interesting trend. So, this is how pay, patients use it today. So what are the trends that are going to change it? So the trends that are going to change it are, first of all, there is more data available. Yeah, new data will be made available. In particular here, data which is collected by patients. And this is different than in the past. In the past, data was collected, data was generated by physicians. Uh, now, patients start to generate this information on their own. If you can see this little device, yeah, this, is a, this is a heart monitor. With this little device, which, cost in, which has production cost of $20, this is something which you can use to record an electrocardiogram um, in, a, in a quite good uh, quality and, and even has an, has an FDA certification. So there will be new sources of data available. The second trend is there will be data under the control of the patient. Why can that happen? This happens because there is mobile infrastructure available. How many of you carry a smartphone around, an iPhone or a Galaxy? Yeah, so almost everybody has this. Yeah? So can you imagine how big the compute, computing power in this room is? This is more than it was in data centers in the, in the 60s and in the 70s. So mobile infrastructure. And then what is happening? Somebody told yesterday having data giving data to the patient, that doesn't help. Patients don't know what to do with the data. They can't interpret. So what's happening now, you have new players who are offering business models, business models that are built on top of this data, which is under the control of the patient. And I will sh show you later what these are, yeah? so second opinion services, for example. So let's start with mobile infrastructure. These smartphones that you have, if you compare it to the other device that was revolutionizing um, the, digital, the digital age. This was the introduction of the first personal computer by IBM in 1983. An iPhone 5 has a thousand times more computation power, has 5,000 times more storage capacity, and most amazingly, it has 25,000 times more connectivity and bandwidth. Yeah? So it can it can compute faster, it can store more, and it can communicate in a, in, with a much, much higher rate. And this mobile infrastructure, this is all available. It's available to be used by any health system without any additional invest. And this is why I think, and I think this is going to change it. Patients are now in a position that they can start to pull their data together. So one example, what I really like from Australia. So Australia introduced a personally controlled health record made it available to the entire population, and um, more than two million patients in Australia have now activated her personally controlled health record. So this is real. Yeah, this is a payer-driven or a health system-driven approach, different to what we are seeing as well. This is um, a new offer that 
Apple is going to uh, release together with its iPhone 6. It's called the Health Book. And the Health Book will be a health record where there is a lots of, of uh, space for including data that is collected from, from all these sensors. So new data will come. This, this data will be under the control under the uh, under the um, under the control of the patient. So how does that look like? These are two examples. This is an amazing um, piece. Uh, this is a digital pill. A digital pill means it's a it's a drug, and there is a small little chip on that drug. It's called a food computer. You can swallow it. It's made of copper and magnesium, so it's completely digested. And once you you swallow it, this little uh, this little food computer gives a signal to a patch that you wear on your on your arm. And why is that good? It's good because it can help to improve adherence of patients because you can say exactly on April 10th, 10 o'clock and seven minutes, Stefan has been taking this drug. And um, they are thinking about introducing completely new ways of working with payers and working with patients to increase adherence and to increase outcomes. This is the little heart monitor that I showed you um, on already, and this is my electrocardiogram, which I recorded uh, three days ago. Um, all is FDA certified. And what I find amazing, they are all thinking about going direct to the patient. Yeah, so, so far they are, already they are still including physicians to drive market acceptance, but what they all have in their mind, we go direct to patients, they all have data scientists working on algorithms to interpret the data. So the, 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 the guy who's running this company, he has, he has collected already 700,000 electro electrocardiograms, and he says, this is my IP. I have my 10 data scientists. They are mining this data, and I want to be as good as a cardiologist in interpreting um, all, this, um, all this data, and then recommend a, um, a patient to go and see his physician or just to, to do nothing because everything's under control. So this is what's going to happen. And last but not least from the US, very interesting, the Blue Button Initiative, which um, obviously seemed to make electronic um, claims data available to 150 million uh, patients. So there is something going on. So, um, and I said there are now new business models emerging on top of this data. This is just one example from the US. It's, um, it's a second opinion service offered by Cleveland. Mayo Clinic has the same, and there are many, many other companies who are offering this. Now imagine you're a patient. You have all this information about your drugs that you are taking. You have your electronic health record, and you would really like to know whether your doctor gives you the best and really best advice. And uh, then you send your data to Mayo Clinic. It's just one click away, and then you have leading physicians in their specific area that they, they um, and they can tell you what they think about your case. So it's really something um, which is going to happen and which can happen much more often if this data is there and if this data is made available. So when is that going to happen and how could that look like? And the interesting question is who is going to lead this? Who is going to lead this? So how can that look like? Very simple, you can start already today and you can download these applications today where you can use your smartphone, scan the barcode on a drug, on several drugs, and figure out whether or not these drugs uh, have some, some, um, have some um, uh, adverse side effects. This is already available today. Now you add these sensors, so you have infrastructure that a patient can use to start to um, to generate this medical advice. Now, what could be a simple next step? A simple next step is you add guideline information, medical guidelines, you add something like the, the Prisco's list, which is a list with information about medication which is not appropriate to people above 65, or you add uh, some other information about drugs which are counterindicated for certain diseases. So is that something which is complicated? No, it's not. It's relatively easy. It could, could be easily done. Um, then, communication with the doctor, relatively simple. You can send it by email to your doctor. You can establish some, some communication platforms to exchange this. Now, you add mobile solutions where patients have their data, their, 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 their record, where this all comes together, data from sensors, data that you collect and, and uh, scan with your, with, your, um, with your phone. And then, last but not least, you have those who start to monetize it. 
they are sitting on top, second opinion services, overread services, or somebody who says, I create your personalized health checkup or your personalized care plan out of this. All these elements are there. Technology is not a problem. There are players in the market who are backed up by venture capital funds with $2 billion of investment. They don't have to make money now. What they do, they bring this stuff into the market, they collect data, they get smart about it, and they say, I'm going to monetize later. So this is going to happen. Now the question is, who is going to lead this? So it could be health systems and payers. Health systems like Australia, payers like the NHS, who has already spent a lot um, for, for a digitization in, uh, in the past. It could be small little startups backed by, by venture capital, or, and that would be my bet, it will be players who have very, very deep pockets and who have experience and reputation in using digitization to disrupt entire industries. These are players like Amazon, these are players like Apple, and they really disrupted the entire media industry. And um, so as I showed you already a little bit earlier, Apple is moving into this direction and they learn from the mistakes that Google made, they learn from the mistakes that Microsoft made because they approach it from a different angle. So if you ask me what I would like, what I would prefer, so I actually would prefer to have a non-profit organization like the public payers that I'm working for um, or the NHS, I would like to have these payers leading it. So if you look into the press, if you are from the UK, who's from the UK and has heard about care.data? Who is critical about care.data? So lots, um, lots of people. So care.data is an initiative um, driven by the, by the NHS where they want to pull all this data together. So and um, there are some good reasons um, in terms of data privacy, why that should not happen and so on. So, what I'm just saying, if you want to have the NHS, if you want to have public payers to play a leading role in digitizing healthcare, then physicians are very important opinion makers. If you are opposing it, you can influence patients, you can influence uh, politics, so you have a choice to make, and um, I think here is a great opportunity, and here is why there is a great opportunity. If you activate patients, and giving all this digital enablement to patients activates patients, they have much better outcomes. They experience less hospital readmissions, they have less medical errors, they, um, there are less, um, uh, there are less health um, 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 issues due, or due to poor communication. This is, an, this is an analysis from the American Association of Retired Persons. So, I want to close here and thank you for your, for your attention and um, the future is bright, digital will come to healthcare as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.